Hello again everyone, welcome to another edition of Afro Blues Retro View. Now, I absolutely love comics, and I have done ever since I was a little kid, never made any pretense about it, and I think some of the imagination that goes into comics is just absolutely fantastic. And, oh, Jesus, that one's an antique. It's probably the reason that my parents decided to get me this when I was younger. Now this, right here, is Comic Zone. Released towards the end of the Mega Drive's lifespan, Comic Zone had a unique setting which made for unique gameplay elements. The basic plot is that Sketch Turner, a comic artist living in New York City, gets sucked into his own comic book, with the villain of the comic, Mortis, being brought into the real world. Before Mortis can wreak havoc on Earth, however, he must first kill his creator, Sketch. This means that as you play, Mortis is constantly drawing enemies into the levels, and at one point even burns a page to try and kill you. Some examples of the clever level design we'll be going into more detail on later. As Sketch, you'll be navigating the panels of the comic, fighting off foes and solving puzzles. The first thing you need to make note of are the controls, which vary depending on whether you're using a 6-button pad or a 3-button pad. You see, on a 3-button pad, A is attack, B is jump, and C cycles through your three item slots. You can then press A to use the highlighted item. On a six button pad though, A is attack, B is jump, C is to either block or use a special attack, which you assign in the options menu before you start the game, while X, Y, and Z are assigned to each item slot. It goes without saying that this game is a lot easier to play on a six button pad, and while it is playable with a three button pad, it just feels awkward. In addition to those actions, Sketch has a library of attacks at his disposal that simply require a combination of the D-pad with the A button. For example, holding forward and pressing A results in a regular punch. Pressing diagonally up and forward and pressing A results in some high kicks. Diagonally down and forwards combined with A, some low kicks. Up and A is an uppercut, and so on and so forth. Despite this, I felt there was little to no tactical depth in the battles. Yes, some enemies will always dodge your special attacks, and the uppercut will save you from every flying enemy in the game, but a lot of the time it falls down to just relentlessly attacking. I never used the block because I didn't feel I could read the enemy movements, and while you're attacking them, the best they will ever do is block. They never seem to counter-attack. The only tactical decisions seem to regard the items that you use and when you decide to use them. One particular enemy is scared of your pet rat roadkill, and will usually shriek and disappear if you bring him out. In other instances, you will need to use items to knock an enemy off a ledge, or use a knife to hit a switch on an adjacent wall. There's one instance where you get past a giant beast by feeding it your rat, who then seems to electrocute it from inside its mouth. There are segments where, if you do everything in the right order, you'll escape without a scratch, but learning this order largely comes from trial and error, as important elements, i.e. explosive barrels, are usually off-screen. The two main criticisms of Comic Zone is that it's too hard and too short. The way I see it, those two arguments kind of counteract each other. You see, the game has three levels. Each level is split into two comic pages each, so six pages and that's it, job done. However, you only get one shot at it. That's right, one life, and your health is only restored at the start of a new level, so that health bar has to last you two pages unless you can find a health pickup. The only time you'll get a second chance at the game is on a very rare occasion that sketch will die and say, is this truly the end, rather than that's it, game over man, which I've only seen happen on pages one and three, and even then on page three it seemingly has to be in the Kung Fung tournament. This forces you to learn the game, you're going to need to know where every enemy is, where every power-up is, and where every shortcut is if you want to reach the end, which actually means it can take a very long time to beat. Also trying to stop you as a boss every other page. The Super Sketch power-up will help you out a lot here, but if you don't have that, there's always an easier way to defeat them if you use your brain rather than your brawn. Oh, and I should also mention there are two different endings depending on the final boss. Even if you do manage to get past every obstacle and actually beat the game, there is added replay value in the fact that every level has multiple routes through it. I've been itching to talk about the level design in this game and how much it informs the gameplay, and here it is. First of all, the game is presented panel by panel. You start in the top corner of a page and work your way down to the bottom corner. 
whether developers were smart was in their decision to give you options as to how you want to do this. On some panels, after clearing all the obstacles, two arrows will appear, showing there are two different routes you can take. You can also uncover secret panels and rooms by using roadkill, or knocking down specific walls or objects. I've seen speedrunners debate the fastest route, trying to decide where multiple enemies or a deadly trap is truly a shortcut, or whether they're better off going through three shorter panels to reach the same destination. This means that when you replay the game, you're actually mapping out the page in your head and putting conscious thought into your route. Very few games have ever made me do that. As mentioned earlier, the setting also allows for some unique quirks. For example, at the cost of a chunk of health, Sketch can tear a piece of the page and fold it into a paper airplane that will take out most enemies and obstructions in one hit. As mentioned as well, there's also a point where Mortar sets fire to the page and you have to race to the bottom before the flames swallow you. And you can also knock enemies through the panel barriers in spectacular style. I have not seen a game take this much advantage of its setting before. There's some real thought put into this, and I have never seen such an exceptional example of innovative level design in all my years as a gamer. Oh, and the music's by Howard Drossen, who worked on multiple Sonic games, Dynamite Cop, and most recently the 2010 Splatterhouse. I shouldn't even need to tell you that it's good. It's so good that the US version came with a soundtrack CD. I'm quite tempted to try and track one of those CDs down, actually. While the game could have been longer, and maybe somewhat more lenient, it does manage to pack in some very interesting and ever-changing scenery, and I don't know if the game would have the same following it has if it were any less relentless. Definitely pick this up. If you're a fan of that era of video games, then this is going to challenge you. And if you're in the games industry itself, please, play this as a lesson in level design. Again, this game is on XBLA and the Ultimate Mega Drive collection that I seem to be forever plugging on this channel. Go have a blast, you know where to send your hate mail when you die for the 50th time. As always, this has been Afro Blue, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.